Thank you all. Assessment is not just about answering questions. Assessment is about navigating scenarios, making decisions, and experiencing the consequences. The world of SIM-based assessment is where learning meets real-world application, all in a risk-free environment. To talk about the SIM-based assessment, we have Dr. Jay Ross joining, to, joining us virtually from USA. To chair the session, I would like to invite Dr. Dinkar Pai, Consultant, Skills Lab and Simulation Center, ABMC, and Dr. Sayaka Oikawa, Project Professor, Department of Innovation and Digitalization, Medical Education, Akita University Graduate School of Medicine, Japan. Thank you. Good morning to all and uh, good evening to Dr. Ross. I think it must be a little late there um, in, in, in Miami. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have you with us uh, to deliver this talk on, uh, uh, to deliver your talk. And uh, just a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Ross. Uh, so Dr. Ross J. Scalisi is a professor of medicine, director of medical technology and uh, technology development and also the director of the Gordon Center for Simulation and Innovation in Medical Education at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, USA. He has been uh, an executive faculty on the Curriculum Steering Committee and is a founding fellow of the Academy of Medical Educators at the Miller School of uh, Medicine. And his special interests include innovative use of simulation for competency-based training and uh, assessment. And he is, of course, widely uh, published. Uh, so with, uh, I won't stand between you and Dr. Ross anymore. Dr. Ross, uh, the audience is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, loud and clear. And are you seeing full screen? Uh, we are seeing the full screen, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, yeah. It's, it's good. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you.
curriculum alignment process, one of the things I recommend is that you blueprint your curriculum. And this is a little template that we've developed in Miami where I work, um, but it follows a framework that I think many institutions use. You see it starts with listing session objectives, then shows what different learning opportunities can help to teach to those outcomes, and then assessment opportunities. And I wanna zoom in on the assessment piece. So this is a little closer view and you can see across the top that we have many different methods of assessment, right? Multiple choice or short answer or essay questions, right? Written exams have been used literally for centuries around the world. Oral examinations are another way. You see that simulation sits here, but so do clinical, real patient encounters. So there's really a number of assessment tools and how do we choose rationally among them um, is sometimes easier said than done. And I wanna make a point now and I'll come back to this that if you're like me and you like simulation a lot, um, we have to be cautious um, that we don't automatically zoom in on simulation as our first choice because it's not always the best match for a particular assessment purpose. So before I choose from among all the many methods, I ask myself several important questions and I would posit these as a nice systematic way that you too could rationally choose. Um, Recording in progress. What assessment methods uh, you would like to use. So the first question that we ask ourselves since we're in the outcomes framework here is, okay, what are exactly the outcomes that we're hoping to assess, okay? There are many different frameworks um, in the United States. Um, we use the ACGME or Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. We have six general competencies that form our framework. If you're in the Canadian model, they use CANMEDS where they describe seven large roles that physicians could play. And I'm sure in India, you also have um, your own competency frameworks. They may be described slightly differently. The exact wording varies you know, across different um, modalities, but you could probably boil most of the competency framework down to three big buckets. And you've probably heard about the KSAs referring to knowledge, skills, or attitudes. The knowledge items are those cognitive competencies, the things that happen up here in your brain. Um, skills describe more psychomotor, things that you actually have to use your hands or your ears, and other senses. And then the attitudes describe those affective or behavioral competencies that in many ways are a little bit harder to define. Things like ethical behaviors or professionalism, team skills, although we use the word skills on them, they're not really psychomotor. I think they fall more in this affective domain or non-technical skills. Sometimes people refer to those. And of course, although it's convenient to kind of break down the various outcomes into one of these buckets, we know that these overlap. Um, and many times what we're truly trying to assess lies at the intersection of some of these competencies. So I do a lot of clinical skills teaching and assessment, um, and you have to have certain knowledge, right? You have to know the anatomy, you have to know the steps of a physical examination or the components of a good history um, in order to exercise the skill of obtaining the history or performing the exam. And then of course, overlaid with those things, you also have to respect patient autonomy, um, patient modesty and so forth. So really many of our day-to-day -day activities in clinical practice often lie at the intersection. But it's helpful, I think, sometimes to break these things down to the extent possible. So that's the first question I ask. What outcomes are we gonna assess? Then we have to ask, at what level do we want to assess those competencies? Because within each of those domains, George Miller described 
in his pyramid framework that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, different levels of assessment. So the foundation is bits of knowledge. That's the nose level. Okay. But being able to apply those knowledge, for example, to problem solve, that's a higher level. Okay. And then talking about or describing in words, knowing how to do a procedure, for example, is quite a different thing from showing that you can actually do that. And finally, showing it for examination purposes. When an, when a, when an examiner is standing over your shoulder uh, with a clipboard, for example, um, and a checklist, well, then, of course, our learners follow all the steps, right? They do perfectly sterile technique and all of that. But the pinnacle, what we're really interested in, in terms of clinical examinations or evaluations or assessments, is what do they do in actual practice? If you want to think about it this way, shows how is more at the in vitro level of assessment, whereas in vivo, what we do in the middle of the night, when nobody's looking over our shoulder, um, that's ultimately what we want to do. And we can kind of break these diff these four different levels up into two subdivisions where we have the cognitive things, and then we have more the skills and behaviors up here, right? This is all upstairs. This is actually putting those things into action in some way. So we also want to consider what is our Miller level? of assessment. Different assessment methods are going to line up better with some of those different levels, right? So for the knowledge and the application of knowledge, written tests such as we've done for eons and oral examinations are quite efficient methods. Simulation, although of course we can assess knowledge in a simulation scenario, um, normally one scenario has a relatively narrow bandwidth, right? We can only assess the, the relatively limited things that happen in that scenario. Um, whereas an MCQ test, I can have 100 or 200 items on there and sample much more broadly. So that's a more efficient way if all I want to assess is knowledge. But a written exam or an oral exam can never really get at the behavioral levels here, shows and does. So then we need other assessment methods there. And here is where I think simulations really have a good role, okay? Often simulations form part of an OSCE station, maybe real patient or maybe a simulated patient in some form or other. Some of these other acronyms here, I, you may or may not be familiar with. OATS is Objective Assessment of Technical Skills. DOPS is direct observation of procedural skills. You can see that some of those are probably going to be simulated. Others are going to be perhaps in real patients. Something like the mini CEX, the mini clinical examination is a workplace-based assessment, but nonetheless, it's performance-based. So it's well-suited for the shows how level, as well as does. The does is actually the tricky one. And that's where simulation, you might at first blush say, well, simulation has no role in the real setting because as soon as they know that it's a simulation, they may alter their behavior. So it would drop back down to the show's how level. But there's actually been some very interesting work done with stealth or incognito SPs, standardized or simulated patients, um, where an actor appears in someone's real clinic without them knowing. Um, and they will pose problem um, that's been scripted to see how the provider, in this case, um, treats them. And this is probably one of our most authentic forms of assessment. I think it's very interesting, but underutilized um, method of simulation-based assessment in the real workplace. The next question that I always ask myself is, what's the developmental stage that I'm trying to assess here? Okay, a certain assessment methods for a first year medical student um, are going to be a little bit different than for, you know, a practicing clinician with many years of experience. And so the developmental levels, there are many different frameworks for describing those. 
You're probably familiar with the Dreyfus brothers model um, where they elaborate different stages of development from novice to expert with several in-between stages. They elaborated these in terms of what are the cognitive processes? How do novices versus experts approach problem solving? But more recently, some other developmental frameworks have come into common usage. Um, in the US right now, we're focusing a lot on EPAs, Entrustable Professional Activities. Um, in the US, these have a core framework for our medical student assessment. Whereas at the postgraduate level, um, our ACGME, again, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, uses milestones. Both of these are similar in that they express the different developmental stages in terms of how the learner or provider can be trusted to perform certain activities. Okay, not at all. They can should just be observing at this early stage um, versus they can do these things completely independently. Again, with some intermediate stages there too. And I put another arrow here, you know, I'm not sure if we have multi-professional participants in the conference. I did have one nursing educator who was in my pre-conference workshop. And you similarly have nursing essentials, at least in the US model, um, where they describe the different steps um, for progression in the nursing education world. And then of course, the final question, which maybe some people say you should probably ask that first, as, you know, what are the context of this assessment? What is its overarching purpose? What are the stakes of the decisions that we're going to make based on this assessment? Um, and what are the available resources that we have or other local factors um, that will impact our choice of assessment methods? So focusing on the purpose and the stakes of the assessment, again, I've already introduced some of these terms that you're all very familiar with, I'm sure. Formative assessment meaning assessment for learning versus the traditional role that assessment used to play more of, which was assessment of learning. Again, formative assessments usually occur during training. They reinforce what has been learned and try to identify areas for improvement. Um, they're used to help the learners and the faculty um, with the ultimate goal that our learners improve. And therefore, you know, the results of a particular formative assessment are generally lower stakes. Whereas summative ones at the end of an instructional unit, which may assign a grade or determine whether you pass or fail or graduate or not, um, those are generally more impactful decisions um, for the examinees. And we often refer to those as more high stakes assessments. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. I don't know if any of the online participants are unmuted, but if you could mute yourselves, that would be great. So where do I think simulation fits into that framework? Okay, and why would we choose simulation versus another method, even at the same level or for the same developmental stage? Well, there are different variables in our clinical examinations. Again, Ronald Harden, um, talked about the use of simulated patients or other simulations in examinations. And he says, you know, for every examination equation, if you will, if it's a clinical exam, there are three variables. Because it's clinical, there's some patient or problem aspect to it. You have an examiner or the test related factors themselves. And then you have what the learner or pr practitioner actually does. And if we if we want to make sure that the results of our assessment are giving us information about the learner and provider, then we can't have these other two things be variable. We want to standardize or control those other two variables to the extent possible. How do we do examiner um, uh, standardization. Well, we train our raters, for example, and the OSCE format was used to get around some of the variability in more traditional clinical exams, like long cases where everybody had a different patient encounter. In an OSCE, 
all the examinees go through the same encounters. In other words, the test questions are the same for everyone. That was never a problem on written exams, but for our clinical examinations, it was a big problem in the traditional way because my attending may have brought me to see one patient that was more challenging than someone brought one of my classmates, right? So the OSCE format and by training and standardizing what each rater does in each of those stations, that helps to control this variable. Where simulation, I think, has its role then is in standardizing the patient component of the equation. And we can use standardized or simulated patients or simulator mannequins, task trainers, and different things like this, right? Simulations are more reproducible. So that's getting at the reliability piece of the assessment equation, right? And the benefits of using simulation is that if it's a device like a mannequin, it's programmable. And if it's an SP, hopefully we train them well so that they consistently give the same examination problem, if you will, to each examinee. Some simulator mannequins even have built-in sensors where they can give you assessment data. Of course, those are not ironclad. It's not a guarantee that you're going to have 100% reliability just by the virtue of using simulations. Um, there are certain threats. Uh, for example, what if the simulator doesn't work right? What if it wasn't calibrated properly at the outset? Its sensors aren't working. What if the SP just doesn't show up? <laughs> and then you have to get somebody last minute in there who's going to ad lib and kind of just wing it. That will be a threat to the reliability and consequently to the validity of those assessment decisions, right? Do raters just ignore the training that they received or do they follow the rubric um, that we're using in a particular assessment station? All of these things are important considerations when we're thinking about using simulations. Now, stepping back, if you think about those four questions that I asked, I've actually put those together in a multi-dimensional framework. Again, most people follow the Miller's levels. I always thought it was interesting that it was described as Miller's pyramid when it was actually just one dimension, right? So it was really should be called Miller's triangle. Um, but I think there are other dimensions um, that we do need to consider. And that's why I had those four framing questions. So we have, what are the competencies across one dimension here? Knowledge, skills, or attitudes. We have the four Miller levels here in a different direction. And then in the Z, if you will, direction, we can have the developmental stage. Okay, and I've just put the edges on there from novice to expert, or you could describe this in any other developmental framework that you choose. And we surrounding that core, those core dimensions are those contextual factors. Like I said, is this a summative exam or a formative exercise? Is it high stakes decisions gonna result from it or more low stakes purposes here? Because then the degree to the reliability, for example, you have to have much higher reliability if high stakes decisions are gonna come out of that exam. It's not so important if it's a low stakes formative exercise, right? And then some of the other contextual things of course are, what are your resources? Because you can theoretically design the most perfect assessment, but if it's not practical or feasible for you to implement in your local setting, the system's gonna break down. So you have to consider the core dimensions and all of these contextual layers that surround them, okay? So back to that curriculum blueprint, I had a lot of different assessment methods lined out across the top, right? Written exams, oral examinations, multi-station OSCEs, simulation has its role, but so do real patient or workplace-based assessments, okay? So how do we choose among those, again, I say, try to line up along those different dimensions, what are gonna be the best techniques? 
And then if you can see, oh, this certain methodology uh, uh, lines up or intersects in multiple dimensions, that's probably going to be a better choice than a simulation, uh, uh, an assessment method that only lines up well in one dimension. So where do I see simulations fitting into that framework? Well, again, although we can assess knowledge and application of knowledge with simulation methods, we already talked about the fact that skills and attitudes cannot be assessed by written means. Only simulation or performance-based exams will get at those competencies. And then the best layer or level in the Miller's scheme would be the shows how level. Again, we could do it in the does if we had incognito SPs as our form of simulation, but this is probably the best match, at least satisfying in two dimensions, right? And then I like to picture this little cube as actually a chest of drawers. And I have my different assessment tools in different compartments of the drawers. And so even though these drawers are the best ones for simulation, I'm going to reach further into the drawer to get at the other dimension. I'll have different assessment tools, maybe ones in the back, full-blown, special effects, multi-patient scenarios um, would probably be more appropriate for experts, but I wouldn't use those same tools for novices because they would be overwhelmed, too much cognitive load. So probably with a novice, I'm going to be using a simple task trainer um, because I don't want to overload them. So I will also choose within a different method section here, like simulations, um, depending on what are my developmental stage of my examinees. Make sense? Okay. Now, say I've made the decision. Simulations line up well, at least in the competencies and in the Miller levels quite well. Then we still have a lot of tools in that drawer, right? We have full body computerized mannequins, or we can have a more simple task trainer that's just one anatomic region. Again, SPs or actors, simulated patients. Purely virtual simulations might be a good choice in certain circumstances. Certain of our newer simulations incorporate virtual reality elements. Okay, we actually have a physical task trainer that we touch, but as we're manipulating it, in this case, doing an arthroscopic procedure, the image that I see of the inside of that joint is actually virtually created by a computer. And some of these very sophisticated models have haptic technology, which is the pressure and the force feedback that you get. So as you're passing a needle or an instrument into that joint, you actually get a little resistance and then oh, it'll it'll release. So you get that, that the feel of an, a, an actual procedure. And then what I'm gonna wrap up with is talking about hybrid simulations combine several different simulation methods. And I'm going to um, make a, a pitch for considering hybrid simulations as some of our most authentic forms. So again, how do we choose from among the vast array of different simulation techniques? Again, ask yourself those same framing questions. Does it match the learner level? Is, am, I, am I gonna overwhelm a beginning medical student with this very immersive, highly realistic simulation? Or do I wanna scale it back and have something that approximates just enough of the skill or clinical task that I'm trying to simulate that it will help the learner? It's also gonna make a big difference if this is for formative or summative purposes, et cetera, okay? And again, using different methods will give you more flexibility number one, and also help to potentially to increase the reliability and validity of your assessments. Now, very commonly used, including in high stake settings have been SPs. And I purposely just put as the title of this slide, just SPs, because what those initials stand for has actually changed. I was pleased to hear the previous speaker said simulated participants. That's kind of the latest um, preferred uh, use of the term SP. 
started with standardized patients. Actually, the very first use of actors um, to kind of standardize assessment things happened in the U.S. Um, back in the late 60s um, by Howard Barrows and uh, Stephen Abrahamson. And uh, they called them at that time programmed patients. The term then shortly later came as standardized patients because they were not used for teaching initially. It was specifically for assessment purposes of medical students. Um, and so they were called standardized. Later, or in Europe, actually, they preferred to use simulated patients. And now some thought leaders in this area prefer simulated participants because the actors aren't always playing the role of the patient. Sometimes they're the family member or someone on the medical team, like the nurse who's in the room and so forth. So the broadest, most encompassing term is simulated participants. It also gives agency to these actors that they are not just instruments to be acted upon like a mannequin is, but they actually have some agency. They are participating actively in this teaching or assessment activity, okay? And when you think about it, in terms of in certain domains, they, they are the most realistic approximation to real patients, aren't they? Right? Because they can certainly portray uh, the psychological aspects of patient cases that mannequins cannot, um, and they can do some physiological aspects, like they can pretend they have pain, say, ouch, when the candidate, you know, presses on a certain body part. Um, they can pretend they're weak, for example. Like in this example, they're, the student is doing a neurologic exam. Well, maybe that patient will have arm drift that they have to detect, okay? And maybe live or recorded, a facilitator, a faculty member, and even sometimes their peers uh, may be evaluating the student performance um, live or recorded. Dr. Ross, and uh, then, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. Um, we probably have about five more minutes for the talk. Is that I okay? am thank getting you. very close to the end. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And I'm at 37 minutes here, and I, I thought we had uh, a full hour. I don't know if I've, my time is truncated because the previous speaker maybe went long. Um, uh, I'm almost done. If this is done for formative purposes, um, the facilitator can then step into the room and give some feedback to the learner. But sometimes, of course, these are used for summative purposes too, which have higher stakes, in which case, the standardization uh, that a simulated patient can do may be questioned. Also, what they can mimic or fake is limited. So for neurologic exam, they can do some things, but a cranial nerve palsy might be a lot harder for them to imitate. Um, and if this was cardiac examination, something near and dear to my heart, they can't fake a murmur or distended neck veins or displaced apex beat um, if they don't happen to have one. So sometimes a mannequin is going to be a better choice. Um, for example, um, in the very high stakes situation of the National Internal Medicine Board Certification Exam in Canada, the Royal College of Physicians chose the Harvey mannequin, which was designed to assess cardiac physical examination skills, precisely because it was highly reproducible, we could program it to have anything, and it could mimic or reproduce things that a standardized patient could not do, right? So again, choice of low stakes formative versus high stakes will influence what form of simulation you're gonna use. One of the critiques of the OSCE format of examinations, and this was an OSCE format exam at the Royal College, was that it breaks down competencies into too small of components. In real life, we don't just walk in and only get the history from a patient. <laughs> and then in the next patient room, we only do the physical exam on, on them. And in the next station, we only do a little procedure on them. In real life, we have to do those things all at once, right? So this is where I think hybrid simulations come in. Leveraging the best aspects of different forms of simulation. 
the task trainers and things are going to be very good if you're going to be doing something invasive. Most SPs do not want you to actually put an IV in them or intubate them. Um, same thing for more f intimate physical examination techniques, where it might not be culturally acceptable, for example, to do those maneuvers on a live patient in a testing format. Okay, Talking to patients, though, and educating them and counseling them isn't something that works well for a mannequin. So combining an SP with a task trainer or even a full body mannequin will allow you to test multiple competencies at the same time. I think that these are probably some of our most authentic forms of assessment because you can get both the technical and the non-technical skills. In this setting, we just put a simple task trainer, a skin suturing pad on this patient. And if you cover it with a drape and maybe put a little bit of artificial blood in there, it actually can look quite realistic. And this actor, this SP, is trained to wince when they do their first stitch um, or you know, ask, what are you going to do when they're coming at them with a needle or with a suture material? So now they have to actually talk to the patient at the same time that they're doing skills. This uh, in the right-hand side, I don't know if you can see it, if it's a large enough thing, but there's a little baby's head coming out here. Underneath this drape, there is a task trainer, a pelvic task trainer, a birthing simulator. And this actor can actually obviously give very realistic, can make um, that seem like a much more authentic simulation um, than if they just had to do the psychomotor skills. Now, of course, this is a higher level functioning, putting it all together. So I probably wouldn't use a hybrid simulation like this for beginners, because um, again, they might be overwhelmed by the stress of this patient uh, screaming and crying. If we have time, I'm just gonna show a very brief portion of a video clip, which uses even a different simulator um, to, I'm just gonna zip ahead to the important part to, for you to see here. But this uses a very rudimentary, simple task trainer that's underneath the drape and the SP herself is controlling that. And you can see that this is another birthing uh, scenario here, postpartum hemorrhage as a complication after. These are more advanced midwifery students. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Pressure was dropping there. Now, if you look very closely here, you can see the reservoir with fluid in it. So there's a lot of blood there on the pad. So a very simple task trainer, but I think you'll agree this was pretty authentic. Um, at you know, adding that communication element with the patient, adding stress to these people, they still had to keep their wits about them. You saw that even though it was a simple, not even a computerized thing they could had to clamp the umbilical cord and proceed as they would um, in a real delivery situation. So I contend that you could um, use, off, use hybrid simulations like this. And if you do what we call in situ simulation, I, I'm not sure the exact setting where this was filmed, it was probably in a simulation or a skills lab, but you could do that same scenario in a real bed in the labor and delivery ward of your hospital, thereby increasing the authenticity even more and not only allowing you to assess individual skills, teamwork, 
but also what are some of the systems factors, the things that take place in that real workplace environment that may impact performance. So um, I appreciate everyone's attention. I hope that I have accomplished the learning objectives that we set out to do. I'm coming up on exactly 45 minutes. So I don't know if you'll allow time still for some questions or comments. I'll be happy to take those. Um, and if not, I will have my email address that anyone can feel free to reach out um, and contact me at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Skaris, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, you showed us the very basic idea of what is a simulation-based assessment, and you showed uh, important questions that we need to think about before we start simulation-based assessment. So let us open the floor. If you have any questions or comment, just let us know. Yes, please. Sir, in the Miller's Pyramid chart, you you have put a chart review in the dust level. How do we how do we do that? Chart review is it? It comes under the dust level of pyramid. Yes, assuming that people um, did their documentation uh, accurately. What they call chart stimulated recall is one method, right? Because then they will go to the medical record. They use this, for example, in the US for our board. Uh, we have oral board examinations for surgeons, for example, and they accumulate a number of cases that they've actually performed in their first years out of graduation from residency. They submit those to the board, and then the board will pull one of those records, one of those charts, and say, okay, doctor, on this particular case, you chose to use this surgical approach. Let's talk about why you did that. And so they use what's documented in the record, and that will also be an authentic workplace-based thing because presumably um, any complications that may have occurred after that real surgery would be documented in the chart and so forth. So that's one way. Um, procedure logs are another way of what people actually do, right? If you record those things accurately, that can be a way to assess those. Thank you very much for asking. Do you have any uh, questions or comment on the floor? If no, may I ask Dr. Dinka? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Dr. Ross, a question for you. Um, we know that uh, a lot of these computerized uh, simulators are also capable of giving uh, feedback or assessment. I just wanted your comment on a facilitator assessment versus the software-based assessment. Do you use them for your, especially for your summative uh, uh, examinations? What are your thoughts on that? So I would say that although I, I mentioned at the outset that some simulators do have sensors that can record you know, how quickly um, people did certain exam maneuvers, which areas they actually touched, how much pressure did they apply, and so forth, that can be useful metrics for some, some assessment purposes. I would say those are in the smaller minority of cases, actually. And the, the other problem that has been encountered, even by specialty boards that have considered using, for example, some of those haptic virtual reality simulators in their board certifications, the problem is they spit out lots of data and there's still a lot of validation work that needs to be done in sorting out, okay, which of these parameters actually meaningfully correlates with, if we're talking about surgery, for example, true surgical skill, right? So they're still sorting out which of the many numbers or data points that these sensors can spit out, um, which are the most useful and predictive. Um, but I would also say that those are probably the minority of cases. In most cases, the simulation provides the, the vignette, if you will, the stem of the question and the actual data that we get. The scores are derived from some kind of a rating instrument, like a checklist or a rating scale that's in the hands of a human rater. I think those are still, to this day, the majority of our assessments, even high stakes ones, um, rely on human assessors um, using some kind of a, a scoring rubric. And that's why rater training is very important also to get uh, reliable and valid assessments. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, uh, Rose. I have one quick question about, uh, you mentioned about built-in measurement capabilities. And then I think that kind of thing is good for technical skill assessment. But in, with the advancement of technology, we use sometimes robots uh, to assess communication skill or AI built-in robots. So if you use that kind of technology in assessing non-technical skills, especially this time communication skills, what kind of risks should we uh, have to think about? Yeah, so that, that's a great question and you're absolutely right. Now that we have natural language processing and other AI um, capabilities, um, there is gonna be enhanced opportunities to use those technologies to assess things like the oral communication skills, um, also to read notes. That's been, you know, the post-encounter documentation of, uh, of a note, for example, has been part of our um, national board exams, for example, for, for medical students, our clinical skills examination. And those was very labor intensive. You actually had, we had to hire a panel of physicians to grade those and train them to, to score them um, consistently and so forth. So there's great potential for AI in those things to give us greater efficiency and time savings of those things. But I don't think those technologies are quite ready for prime time yet. Again, the validation research um, that will show correlation with other variables and things like that um, has yet to be uh, demonstrated. So. I think there's great potential, but we're not quite there yet. They're coming, for sure. Thank you so much. So uh, please uh, give a applause to uh, Ross again. Thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for joining us today, virtually defining Recording the constraints stopped. of time zone. As a token of appreciation, uh, would be sent across to you uh, via post. I now request Dr. Sanjeev to honor our chairperson. Oh, okay.